Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, so today I'll talk about the magnetic universe. I'll just reduce everything in the title and just start with magnets. So um, I remember as a child, I was very intrigued by magnets because it has that peculiar pop property that two magnets can actually stick together. And um, all of us probably at some point of time in our home, we have encountered magnets. That's something part, which is part of the everyday life. Um, the first encounter probably with magnets will be with fridge magnets. And um, by the end of this talk, I'll convince you that the fridge magnets are actually quite powerful. Um, in principle, you can build a very, very strong magnet and do something like this, which I don't recommend, of course, and I don't take the responsibility of the consequence. Um, so in our everyday life, we actually have all the different devices in which they are, uh, there are magnets. Uh, I have given two examples. One is the credit card, which has a magnetic strip. And there are tiny magnets which get, get aligned when the, read, when the reader reads the magnetic strip. Uh, the other examples include cars and microwave ovens and uh, essentially everything that we use, cell phones. Um, but one thing is that in our modern devices, it's not very intuitive that there are magnets. Right? Uh, in the older days, there were compasses, which people used probably 1,000 years back. They first used it for maritime navigation. And uh, this compass has essentially one needle, one magnetic needle, which has this property that it always remains aligned on the surface of the Earth, like in a local sense. And uh, of course, it's great to decide which direction, uh, like decide some uh, point of direction and then move based on that and travel. So this was getting used for navigation. But this peculiar property was not really very well understood why there is always an alignment. Uh, one more thing about this alignment is that if you bring a bar magnet, sufficiently strong bar magnet, close to the needle, you can see that you are disrupting that alignment. So for example, in this image, if you start from the so-called end point, which is the north, which is the convention is that we call it North Pole and South Pole. So if you take a needle to the North Pole, there will be a certain alignment. Then you bring it down, then the alignment changes. And gradually, if you go towards the South Pole, you'll see that almost it changes, like the entire needle uh, moves around. And uh, if you keep doing this at different distances, you can basically trace out lines. And so these, these lines are what uh, we call some sort of a sphere of influence or a magnetosphere. And uh, if what really happens for needles on the Earth is this, that the Earth center has a giant magnet. And if it's possible to take the needle and keep, uh, keep just noting down its orientation at different points on the Earth's surface, you'll see the needle does the same thing. It actually uh, traces out uh, uh, lines on the surface and the lines change with distance from the Earth. So we broadly call this kind of lines to be the magnetic field. And uh, because there is a giant magnet uh, in the center of the Earth, which is pretty powerful, but it turns out that the fridge magnet is a lot more powerful than the uh, Earth's magnet. It's like, depending on where you are, it will be 100 to 1,000 times weaker than the fridge magnet. OK, so um, magnets affect magnets. We have seen that. We know that from our everyday experiences. But what really means for you know, a medium or a cosmic region or astrophysical environments to be magnetized? What magnetic fields really do in astro astrophysical atmospheres? So um, I'll start with one example. Uh, we are zooming out from Earth now, and we are going to the solar system. Uh, this is a very nice cartoon of, uh, of uh, an uh, experiment. So um, there is sun and the red ray of thing, ray of light is like a solar 
uh, uh, solar wind going past the orbits of the planets. And it turns out that this particular solar eruption was going through Earth and Mars. And European Space Agency could actually monitor the Earth and the, and the Mars around that time. And they find out that the Mars atmosphere is lost very fast, while the Earth's atmosphere is a lot more intact. And the difference between Mars and Earth is that the Mars magnetized magnetization of the Mars or the, or the giant magnet that we were talking about for Earth is actually very weak in the Mars. It's, it's almost non-existent. So what role does magnetic field really play is the following. So now you are familiar with Earth's magnetic fields. So that's the blue. And I have also shown the kind of bar magnet that you can imagine for Earth. And then the solar wind magnetic fields are shown in uh, red or orange. And all these magnetic field lines actually go over the magnetosphere of the Earth. And this is why uh, Earth's atmosphere is protected from these very hot solar winds, except some events where actually geomagnetic storms could affect the Earth's atmosphere quite severely. There was one event, uh, thanks to my colleague who pointed out uh, uh, about this particular event in 1859. And uh, typically this has some sort of, there is always some sort of risk of getting affected and uh, power grids getting disrupted by the geomagnetic storms. Okay, so that's the story of solar system. Now we are getting into the sun. Um, so it was pretty clear that solar wind has um, magnetic fields and this field is very strong uh, comparable to uh, depending on which region we are talking about it's pretty much comparable to the Earth's magnetic field. Um, the, uh, so I have given a, pic, uh, a cartoon of how the magnetic field lines will look for the sun. A uh, very peculiar thing about the solar magnetic field is that there is, of course, there is a giant magnet with some polarity, again, North Pole and South Pole. And this, this uh, polarity can get flipped, which means the red can become blue over a certain number of years. Uh, this may also happen for planets, but for Earth, it is actually a very slow process. For Sun, it is a pretty rapid process that you can actually understand such cycles over time. Now let us zoom out even more. And um, so the other uh, picture that I'm showing here, it's our galactic plane. So uh, the way to visualize this image is that we all have panoramic mode in our camera. So if I take the camera and just rotate around, I'll take an image of this entire auditorium. So imagine a camera being taken all around the earth and then this is the e image that you create. So the red region is the galactic plane where a lot of material is there. The main galaxy actually resides there. So a lot of stars and gas and dense gas, uh, all of these are in the central region. The striations are basically these field lines. And you can see that it has actually a zigzag pattern. There is no uh, coherence in these patterns, unlike the magnetic field lines of the Earth, which means that you can imagine that there are many, 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 many tiny magnets all over the place, and the field is created by those. Okay, so this is Milky Way, and um, in other regions of the Milky Way, so that was the global view of the Milky Way, this is a very specific region of the Milky Way. This is called Keyhole Nebula. Uh, nebula is where star formation happens, and um, astronomers could actually uh, trace out the magnetic fields of this region. And um, if you see that there is some ordering, like there is some large scale order of the magnetic field, but then some field lines are moving out. Uh, so the physical scenario that people consider in such cases is whether material is flowing out or there is a stability in the, in the galaxy. So you can actually study several physical procedures like stellar outflows uh, from this kind of image. Okay, so from Milky Way, let us now move outside. One of the very famous 
pictures is this uh, left image. Um, this is the first ever image of the supermassive black hole at the center of a, a galaxy, which is M87. And uh, this is the event horizon region, which, where event horizon is, is uh, considered to be the region from which you can get the last light. Otherwise, you cannot get anything uh, back from the black hole. And again, these triations are basically the, uh, the field lines into the black hole. And uh, you can, again, use these lines to understand certain processes around the black hole. The most important being how material goes into the black hole or whether it is resisted to go inside uh, because of the field lines. So uh, material, otherwise material will give in to the gravity of the black hole. So field lines actually might help to prevent that. On the right, it is uh, again a galaxy, which is called M77. And uh, the white lines show the whole galactic structures. So uh, basically in this galaxy, the field lines are quite well ordered according to the galactic, the morphology of the galaxy. And uh, in the background, there are optical images and the diffuse X-ray emission uh, all composed together in this picture. Um, about the, we can go back to the fridge magnet for uh, what kind of strengths this have. So the left one is actually comparable to the fridge magnet in terms of strength. Uh, the right one has a million times weaker magnetic fields. So if you, next time you see the fridge magnet, consider how powerful that is actually. Okay, so we were so far showing um, pictures of magnetic field in various different kind of environments. And you might ask like, what is, like how do you actually see magnetic field? How do you observe? This is not like light, which you can see and capture uh, in different wavelengths. But it turns out that uh, magnetic field can actually interact with light in a certain way. So I'll give one example. Uh, imagine there is a source of some wavelength. Here it is radio wavelength. So it's uh, emitting light in a certain wavelength. And then this light is actually passing through the intervening medium, which has a lot of galaxies, a lot of gas, stars, and everything. Now, if the intervening medium has magnetic fields, then this light starts oscillating in a very different plane. So it actually changes this plane of oscillation depending on how strong the magnetic field is and what is the orientation of the magnetic field. By orientation, I mean how those lines look. Um, now, one interesting thing is this particular property of polarization is actually used in, in various methods to look into different, uh, different like environments. And this is the, all the pictures that I showed. Essentially, it was polarized light that uh, our telescopes or our satellites capture. And then we uh, trace out the field lines in those systems. So um, from this, I will go into um, computer simulations of uh, our universe. So it turns out that we cannot always look and find magnetic fields in all the diffuse regions. If magnetic field is very weak in certain regions, then it's difficult to see. So what we really do is we create uh, models of universes or models of specific astrophysical regions and we try to see how that region evolves over time. And these are usually run in uh, very large supercomputers. By supercomputer, I mean there are, uh, yeah, there are parallel processes running uh, this kind of simulation over, uh, over a span of up to many months and years. So one such simulation shows this. Now this entire box is like a mini universe. And wherever there is white, uh, there is large density, and the black regions are sparse regions. In the uh, highly dense regions, there are many, 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 many galaxies. And uh, here in, in this image, the blue lines actually stress out all the magnetic fields. 
And you can see that there is no order basically at the larger scales. So it's all very random at the larger scales. And this is what we expect from theoretical and computational models. Um, but then as you zoom in gradually to all those sources, uh, which I showed before, you start getting some order, some pattern in the, in the magnetic field. Also an interesting point to note is that uh, the field at these scales uh, is actually very, very small. It is, again, a few million times smaller than a typical fridge magnet. Um, I will go to the last part of my talk, which is about the, the question is, do we know how these magnetic fields emerge and how these fields get ordered at the larger scales? Um, so uh, currently we don't, that's the uh, best answer. Uh, but people have some guesses. So two most important competing uh, uh, theories for the growth and evolution of magnetic field is that in the universe, in the earliest times, there were some seed magnetic fields. We do not know how those originated. And these seed magnetic fields can grow. And that's why we see magnetic fields at all different scales all over the universe. The other competing theory is that um, the kind of strong magnetic fields that I showed for solar uh, corona, solar uh, winds, solar corona, or around the Earth, uh, or around the black hole, uh, those kind of fields can be injected into the universe and those can grow. So on the left, there is the first kind of magnetic field generation. On the right, there is the second. So just to understand how, what it all means, on the left, basically, there was a seed field which started growing. So the blue is less in strength, red is more in strength. So field is becoming stronger and stronger in certain regions, and uh, it's weaker in the sparse regions. In the right, what happened is the white is basically uh, where there was no magnetic field, and you, we started off with the white region. And then gradually, as magnetic field was getting injected due to some processes around stars, around black holes, uh, these fields can then permeate all the uh, universe. It doesn't uh, go to very large distances, clearly. Uh, so it is, it is very concentrated in certain regions. So with this, I will come to my summary. And I have written three points from the beginning. So firstly, uh, the fields in certain astrophysical scenarios are very, very weak. We, if we go back to the fridge magnet, it's actually very strong compared to the diffuse regions in the universe. The second thing is that we can actually conclude certain physical processes based on what kind of field we see in astrophysical environments. We can comment on whether the material is outflowing, whether the material is going into the black hole, whether uh, there is uh, some sort of disruption in the order, and so on and so forth. The last thing that I talked about is uh, the origin. We actually don't know. There are two competing uh, theories of the origin of magnetic field. And uh, basically, if there is seed from very old times, then we need to understand why those seeds were generated. And then we are good to go. We have a magnetized universe. Uh, if there is no seed, then the second scenario is actually very much plausible, where somehow around very dense regions, we start getting fields generated. And then these magnetic fields can permeate the regions in the universe around those sources. So I will stop there, and I will take questions. So we have good news for you. So we are going to do some stargazing. Um, it's not quite good enough to do the full shebang with the screens and everything. So the CAA have very kindly volunteered to go and do some laser guided tours of the night sky. And we're going to open a couple of the telescopes. So yes, yeah, so after the talk and after a couple of questions, uh, there will be some stargazing. Before that, do we have any questions for our speaker? Yes. Uh, 
Um, yes. So in, if it's very dense, it means the material uh, in the universe, uh, this has like clumped together. And there is a chance that this material will actually carry the magnetic field with it as it clumps together. So there is a chance of more, of course, if you take the example of the Mars and the Earth, you can clearly see that it's very useful to have magnetic fields in the planet and it keeps the atmosphere intact. Very good question. This is um, an active area of research. There is something called dynamo process. So magnetic fields can grow in certain places due to some processes. One being that one very, even without dynamo, one easy way to grow magnetic field is you take some magnetized material and you just bring them together and they clump together. That itself will bring density. If you if you imagine those lines that I showed, if you bring the material threaded by those lines and you bring them together, the lines become denser, right? So that's how it can grow. But there is another very active area of research, which is called dynamo process, which can happen due to, for example, in the Earth's atmosphere, Earth rotates. So any kind of processes which can uh, kind of twist the magnetic fields that can generate um, uh, stronger fields in certain regions. It's a it's a very good good question. Um, so uh, a lot of the regions on the on in the universe are actually quite hot, uh, and uh, it happens that. Uh, there are some processes in the center of the sun that can generate very high temperatures and then this gas, this hot gas can come out and this circulation keeps happening. So the sun is kind of maintained at that hot temperature. And these are processes which are, which essentially create certain, uh, uh, certain elements like you have probably heard of oxygen, nitrogen, uh, uh, car, uh, iron, and all those elements are essentially created in the, uh, in not just sun, but in, in stellar atmospheres. And the process itself makes uh, the surroundings very hot. And then this uh, material, this hot material can circulate by some process called convection. So it's again, it's a very open question how the sun's atmosphere is maintained at, at hot temperatures. You know, this this is act, actually again an active area of research. So the physics we think about the generation of magnetic field indicates the flow of electricity. So does like the galactic magnetic field indicate there is some massive flow of like uh, elect electricity carrying particles like iron yes. within the galaxy and even larger structures of the universe? Exactly. So, um, so anywhere you get ionization, for example, you'll start getting charged particles, uh, electrons notably, because electrons are light that can move around better. So any charged particle, any moving charged particle will generate magnetic fields. But what is not entirely known is uh, whether you can generate sufficiently large magnetic fields by, by that generic process. So a confusion is still there that you need some sort of seed field from early universe and that can, uh, you know, like you can calculate some sort of quantities and you can compare what quantities you need to sustain the current magnetic field configuration. But, but that's, that's very much possible. Double dose of bad news, I'm afraid. It turns out we're not stuck anything. Um, I'm really sorry. We, we were hoping to dodge the gaps in the clouds and get to see something, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm afraid there's nothing. This is the joy of doing astronomy from England, by the way. This is why this is why professional telescopes are in places like Hawaii and Chile, where we don't have any problems. Um, so yeah, I, I can only apologise. We, we did our best for you, um, but yeah, the, the clouds have thwarted our plans. Uh, so yeah, do we have any uh, any any more questions for our speaker now? We have all the time in the world. <laughs> no. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. Well.
well, let's uh, thank Prakriti again. Thank you so much. So there'll be another, uh, you have to do a second talk. There'll be another talk. Uh, we might do it quite soon. We normally, <laughs> this evening is turning out chaotic. We normally do refreshments. But I think the people that are making the refreshments are currently waiting in the telescope trying to see through the flowers. Uh, so I tell you, if, you, if we come outside and wait a little bit, I'll see if we can put, put some refreshments for you. And then there'll be another talk in about 10 minutes or so. That would be amazing, can you? Yeah. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so the, the two students are in the six minutes. Let me come and give you a hand as well.